It's great to be with you guys, and I'm excited to share with you guys about rethinking what school really looks like. I want to talk about what's called flipped mastery learning. What the heck is that? That's what we want to talk about. First of all, I want you to imagine something. I know this is going to be hard, right? Imagine that you get new students every week. Imagine that many of them haven't been in school for a very long time, maybe for months. They come to you with different skills, different backgrounds, different levels of education and parental support. Some come knowing your content, but some come with gaps in their knowledge. And many also come with pressure from their parents, pressure from themselves, and I'm going to argue also untold pain. They're bringing them baggage into their lives, into your classroom. And you might say, wait a second, John, that's what my classroom looks like now. But imagine if that was your life. That's the way education works where you're at. I've been writing a new book, and in writing this book, Mi Libro, uh, I had a chance to interview some teachers who, this is their reality. They teach at a Department of Defense, or a U.S. military school in Germany, and the problem is, is that when a student shows up to their school, they've probably had a month off because their parents have been transferred to the, the base in Germany. And the kids come with different levels. And so they've lived this reality that now most of us have had the chance to live, the COVID reality, but they've lived it for years and years and years. And they have an answer that helps us figure out how to teach in this COVID world. And in fact, with some of the issues that I know that you are facing now. So what, what am I talking about? Well, I had an opportunity to Google the world. Let me back up. So I was curious about this whole thing with COVID and school. And so I went to Google images and I said, well, let's just Google the word COVID in school. And what does it actually look like? Well, this is what one looks like in Taiwan. This is one in Argentina. Notice no students in the room, all right? That the University of Oklahoma, that looks painful. <laughs> this is at uh, the Pantheon University in Francia, right? In Japan, at the University of Kentucky, Universidad de Kentucky, at the Vatican, right? In Italy, South Korea. But then... My guess is that some of the realities that you're facing right now, and I know especially those of you in Brazil with, with COVID taking off in just horrible ways, maybe this is what your school looks like, right? This is what it looks like in the United Kingdom, or at one point it did, right? This is the Zoom classroom. We're, we're in a Zoom room now, right? You're learning so differently. Stanford Medical School. Isn't that kind of scary to you that Stanford Medical School is doing it via Zoom? I, I want them practicing on people. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. At Furman University, all these classrooms meeting in Zoom. At Harvard. In Indonesia. So now, now what does it look like from you as a teacher, right? This is probably what your room looks like right now as you're teaching. Right? In South Korea. Brookings Institute, so a very famous university at New York University. I just high school in the, or elementary school in the United States. So it looks like this all over the world. That's what it's looking like. So what are we facing? What is it going to look like when we get back to whatever normal is? Because at some point, the pandemic will end. Because that's what pandemics do. They end at some point. When will that be? Will it be you know, in three or four months, we'll be in a year. But here is a study by the World Bank that had me intrigued. Um, they're saying that there is a huge amount of learning loss happening, right? So what does that mean? Well, the World Bank said regarding Central and South America that 120 million of the region's school-aged children had already lost or at risk of losing an entire academic year. Now, I probably don't have to tell you this because this is your reality. You are in Central and South America and your students are facing significant learning loss. They made some conclusions in their study. They said this, the learning loss losses will likely be substantially larger for children in the lowest income quintile, right? Widening the already high socioeconomic achievement gap by 12%. So I know many of you are teaching in private schools and some of you are in the public schools and certainly the ones in the public schools are facing a much, much bigger challenge. 
So as the study made a conclusion, it came up with six key recommendations. And I'm going to put them in Spanish for you here. And here are the six key recommendations. What I'd recommend is, this, let me just pause for a minute. I'll let you read these to yourself. Now what I want to do is I want to focus in on one. I think this is the one that's most important, the one that we as educators can make the biggest difference in, and that is this one, right? That maestros y directivos necesitaran apoyo para obtener las abatalios para optimizar la alternancia entre las actividades en persona y remotas, right? The teachers and our leadership, I know a lot of you are leaders and directors of your school, how are we going to optimize education for when we do return to in-person and also this whole concept of remote. How do we do that? What We have a problem. We have a huge problem that we're facing in the world of education. And I guess, is there an answer? Is there an answer? So where are we going to look? You know, hacia donde mira? Where can we look to find the answer to this question? Well, miramos atrás. Let's look back. Back to what? Well, the 1950s to this character. I'm sure you're all familiar with the famous Benjamin Bloom, the American educator who came up with Bloom's taxonomy. But he, I don't know if you know this about Benjamin Bloom, but he's mostly famous for his taxonomy. But he spent the vast majority of his career, particularly his later career, studying mastery learning. And in 1984, he wrote a paper uh, where he talked about, he called the two sigma effect, the search for methods of group instruction as effective as one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So there's a summit, seminal graph in the article. Again, this, I know this is old, 1984, but it's still applicable today. He compared traditional teaching and student performance. That's the conventional, right? The first, the lowest line, the bar graph. And then you have mastery learning, all right, and you can see, you know, summative assessment scores or achievement scores, and then one-on-one -on -one tutorial. So the research at that time in 1984 showed that mastery learning gave you one standard deviation improvement on test scores, or we call that a one sigma effect. But if you have the privilege of having one-on-one -on -one tutoring, all right, like think you're like Prince Harry when he was a boy, or you know some person of very great means, and then your family could hire a one-on-one -on -one tutor. Those people tend to have two sigma or two standard deviation improvement in their test scores. And one of the conclusions or uh, statements maybe that, that Bloom said in his article was this. He says, if the research on the two sigma problem yields practical methods, catch this in the parentheses, methods that the average teacher or school faculty can learn in a brief period of time and use with little more cost or time than the conventional instruction, it would be an educational contribution of the greatest magnitude. It would change popular notions about human potential and would have significant effects on what the schools can and should do with the educational years each society requires of its young people. This paper, this paper in 1984, was essentially a clarion call to educators to come up with a way that's as effective as one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And he's saying, this is like a challenge. Figure this out. Is there a way? Is there a solution to the two sigma problem? That's what he's asking us. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to boldly say something that we've solved the two sigma problem. And it's a combination of mastery learning and one-on-one -on -one tutoring that can be done by the average teacher given a little extra support and it will cost a little extra money, but it's not gonna be crazy. I've been doing this uh, combination for years. Hundreds, no, not thousands of the educators are using this method all over the world and it's working. Let's listen in as we hear some students talk about the Double Sigma class. Um, this class is more laid back. It's chill, but you're still learning. Like you're actually letting in the knowledge. It's 
like the flipped part of it, like you're more independent and you can go at your own pace, but you're still on track. You can't fail. I mean, you kind of, it's, I mean, it's kind of impossible to fail this class, to be honest, because you're literally given every resource possible to pass this class. Like, you are able, like, mastery, because you don't move on until you have mastered it. I mean, the test, not necessarily, but, like, your mastery quizzes, like, you know them in, like, the notes, and then the quizzes are, are with the notes, and, like, just every resource that you give us helps us to succeed. It's like, you know what you're going to be doing, and you can go ahead. Like, you go at your own pace, you can go ahead, you can be a little bit behind, because you get time in class to also work on your stuff. We are capable of learning it on our own with all the resources that you give us. So this young lady is in a, uh, a middle school, a year seven, a mastery class in Tennessee. And one of my friends teaches this class. And you can sort of hear her heart, something about going at her own pace. So what, what, what is she talking about? Well, before I get into the details of the mastery learning class, I need to talk a little bit about flip learning because it's a combination of flip learning and mastery learning is what the answer is. And just a little background on flip learning, right? You've all seen Bloom's Taxonomy. Now, in a flipped learning class, well, let me back up. In a regular learning class, what typically happens is the teacher stands up and lectures, and they spend the bulk of their class time at the bottom two levels of Bloom's Taxonomy, right? At recordar and understanding. Uh, <laughs> I forget what uh, understanding is in Espanol. But the two bottom tiers of Bloom's Taxonomy. And, and by the way, let me just confess for a moment. For the first 19 years as a teacher, I taught in the standard traditional way. And I spent most of my class time doing the bottom two tiers of Bloom's Taxonomy. And what I did is I then sent my kids home to do the hard stuff. Applicar, analysar, evaluar, creatar. Uh, those things I sent them home to do. But if you think about that for a moment, where does the student need the help? They need the help, the expert help, when they're doing the hard stuff. So the top of Bloom's Taxonomy is the hard stuff and the bottom and the easy stuff. So what if instead you flip Bloom's taxonomy on its head and you spend more class time at the top, crear, evaluar, and analyzar, and less class time on remembering and understanding? That's the key. In fact, as I've thought more, and I published this in one of my books, um, I rethought this and said, actually, what you should do is you should spend the bulk of your class time in the middle of Bloom's taxonomy at applicar and analyzar, because those two is where most of class, I don't think it's unrealistic. It's, I don't think it's realistic, it's unrealistic to spend most of your time at the creation level in at least a K-12 setting, possibly at university or like a doctorate level course, you're gonna spend more time at the creation level. And, and basically the idea of flipped learning is you do the easy stuff, all right, when the student is what we call the independent space, when they're working alone, alone sometimes in the classroom or oftentimes when they're working alone at home so that you can utilize your class time or your group space, right? Espacio Grupo, your group space uh, to do the hard stuff because where does the student need the help? In the hard stuff. You need to do the hard stuff when the teacher's there to help, not when they go home and their parents can help. I teach chemistry, right? You know, maestro de chemico y físico, right? Ciencias. I teach physics and chemistry. Those are very difficult subjects for students. And their parents can't help, even if their parents had chemistry when they were in school. They forgot it a long, long time ago. And so my students would go home and they didn't know what to do. But now they can come to class and I'm there to help them. I am the best expert they know on chemistry and physics. And they need me when they struggle. So what's the answer? The answer to learning loss. What is the answer to that? Qual es la respuesta? Wow. <laughs> And I've already given it to you, I guess, but it's not just flipped learning. It's not just mastery learning. It's flipped mastery learning. When we combine these two things together. Now, you understand the concept of mastery, by the way. Let me just briefly talk about mastery. We understand mastery learning. If you uh, went to get your license to drive a car, you had to pass the test. If you didn't pass the test, you didn't get the license. Your doctor, she took the board exam to become a doctor. If she failed the test, she isn't a doctor. You have to actually pass the test, so to speak, in order and demonstrate mastery in order to get the license. 
to get the um, the certificate or whatever it is. You can't be called doctor unless you pass that test. And the test isn't just a written test. It sometimes is you must do things, right? It's it's a, it, uh, an assessment that makes sense, okay? So here's the gist or the flow chart. So think of mastery as a cycle. It's a circle, and you start in the uh, left side, if you will, um, izquierda. A clear learning plan and clear objectives. You start with very clear objectives, and then you flip your content. This is very important. You're gonna any kind of direct instruction is flipped, meaning it's probably recorded in a short video, or there is some easy to access text for the student to read. That's the introductory content or at the top of the graph. Then we move to very specific or discrete activities. Now the key on that is you want those activities to be at the higher levels of blooms, abajo, right, at the top. And then there is assessment or mastery checks. And if they pass the mastery check, the assessment of whatever that might look like, then they move on. If they don't, that's key, then you remediate. And then you start the cycle again. That's the idea of what mastery learning is. Now, by the way, Bloom said in a number of his articles, not just the 1984 article, but when he did some stuff, he said, mastery learning works, but how do we make it work? It turns out that there, the, he had lots of evidence that mastery learning worked in the 1970s and the 1980s, but the problem with mastery learning were actually two key issues. Here are the two issues that he faced. How do you get lots of teachers to do mastery learning? Well, problem number one is if you have to teach something, and I mean by teach is do like a lecture, when do you do it if the students are not all on the same place in the curriculum at the same time? Or you know, if you're using a, a chapters like a book, you're not on the same chapter, the same section in the same chapter. How do you do that? Fast forward to you know, 2008, when myself and Aaron Sams were playing around with flip learning and kind of helping to kind of chart the beginnings of that when we realized, well, we've solved this problem because... I can be 20 places at once if I've made these videos of me teaching chemistry or physics. So we've solved the problem of direct instruction. And the other big issue that we have to face is the issue of assessment. Because when the student gets to the end of whatever, you know, some content, then the student has to take an exam or some kind of an assessment. But if they fail, they have to take a different exam. And you can't give them the same exam. Otherwise, that doesn't work. So um, how do you do that? Well, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but the key is, is that technology has solved both the, the logistical problem of when to do direct instruction, and it's also char charged, solved the problem of assessment. And so the issues he faced, technology has solved, and he could not have dreamt of that, you know, the internet and all the things that have happened um, in 1970-odd or 1980-odd, whatever that was happening. So let me give you the, the hallmarks of a flip mastery class. Now, some of you are saying, I like the idea, but how do I do it? And the answer is, it takes, it's, it's a lot of work. And I'm going to just give you a super high level. I'm not going to go into great details on all the ins and outs to make this work. But I want to give you the, sort of the hallmarks, if you will, of the pillars of what this might look like. So you can get a picture of what it is. Uh, this is, in fact, the big project I'm working on. I'm writing a book about this very topic right now. be out in about a year that goes through this, but I have also written about this many times and others as well. So hopefully if you want more information, you're going to find other places to get it. All right. For what it's all said, let me talk about the, the 11 things. One of the key things that make the flip mastery classroom work is there is no whole class instruction. I have not lectured to my students. These are my students in my class two weeks ago. I've not lectured in my classroom since 2007. Because I've made these cheesy videos. All right. You can see me in the video there with my the other chemistry teacher, and we make these videos together, and our students are actually watching them in class. But so I'm still lecturing. Let me hear that. But I'm not doing it in front of the whole class, ever, never. Okay. Some people still do that. I talked with a teacher just yesterday who does whole class instruction in her mastery classroom, but I'm not sure it's. It would be better if she'd made these as videos. She teaches uh, third grade, so little little munchkins, right? All right, so number one, no whole class instruction. Number two, it's done at a flexible pace. Now, if you recall, the young lady that we heard from earlier, she talked about, I can go at my own pace. 
Now, that's probably fine for her. She was a better student. But I found that some students, if you don't give them a pace, they won't take a pace. I've got some students who would just sit and do nothing all year. So I have to give them a pace, but it's flexible. That's important to understand. And how you logistically set that up is kind of complex, but it's it's all about setting benchmarks or setting specific targets. So I was with my students. It's uh, This is the first day that I've been back to school. I was out a couple of days due to some illness stuff. And on, I told them that by the end of this week, you need to get through, I say my geology class, they, my students had to get through the end of a, a level. So I actually call my, my units levels. It's kind of gamified. So they had to get to the end of a certain level so that they can start their, their evaluation, their test. And again, I've, I've gamified this called a boss battle. The boss battle, they must be doing, they must finish it by the end of next week. And they have some, there's some flexibility, but I've also given them a timeline that, that works for them. All right. So number two, a flexible pace. Number three, extreme differentiation. Now this is important. I am differentiating as I'll say on the fly. I'm making decisions as I walk around the room on what I'm going to do and how I'm going to differentiate. I'm, I'm actually giving harder questions to my more advanced students and easier questions to my more basic students. And I'm doing this primarily verbally as I just walk around the room. Let's take a look at what this might look like, short video. So see, I got students here doing one experiment, a different experiment, so there's lots of different things happening. All right, you can see the classroom. A lot of kids were gone that day. And then, and so three different experiments set up in my room. There's a student who's taking a, a test, a summative assessment on a computer. By the way, pre-pandemic here, Here's a student watching a video. She's just taking notes. And then I'm doing a mastery check. I'm doing an assess uh, what I would call a formative assessment. And then that's another mastery check. But now what thought student one-on-one. -on -one. So hopefully you can see, I sometimes describe my room as like a three-ring circus, but there's probably about six things happening simultaneously. And that may sound crazy. And by the way, it's really super crazy. I do this in a chemistry class where there's dangerous chemicals and it works. In fact, I would actually argue that it's even safer uh, because I have small groups of students doing experiments at a time instead of everybody all at once where I can't monitor. In fact, I was going to be gone. My wife had surgery. So I was gone this week. Um, and uh, last week, I decided to do an experiment all at once. And it ended. <laughs> it didn't go well because my troubled boy group, I'm sure you've all got one of those. One of the boys, there was boiling water, and he poured boiling water on a girl's shirt. I mean, dangerous. He's he got kicked out of school. For, I mean, it was bad. Okay. Uh, but because I wasn't, because I had six or seven groups going simultaneously, I wasn't able to keep my special eye on this one group, which if they were doing it alone, I would have been very much akin to what was happening. So uh, it's kind of like I've learned from this. <laughs> like, okay, mastery labs are way better. All right. So number three, extreme differentiation. Number four, I, I can't tell you guys, the amount of teacher-student interactions I get with students is one of the most rewarding things I do. I get to hang out and talk to kids. And it's just magic. Like today, in my geology class, we're talking about weather. So, you know, the hurricanes and all this kind of stuff. But we're talking about air pressure. And all of a sudden, we had this complete side conversation with me with about four students because I was doing a group mastery check with four students at once. And those students were asking crazy, awesome questions. And I, I told them this, you know, we're talking about like how different light waves work and how that relates to different, how radiation works. And, and I told them the story, um, a powerful story from my own family where my, my grandfather, uh, my abuelo, he died of cancer when I was maybe two years old, but it was because he was exposed to x-rays. So he actually got radiation poisoning because he was a doctor and he was setting people's arms before they knew this, like 1920. Uh, he didn't know that, uh, nobody knew that x-rays were harmful to the body and he kept like setting people's bones under x-rays. And we had a powerful moment just to talk with each other about what's going on um, with radiation. And they really connected with my personal story, but it was just like four or five students. So number five is, and you've seen this in some of the videos, is this kids have the opportunity to really do a lot of collaborative student work. And as a note here, this is a picture from last year because <laughs> there's no masks 
you might notice the mass pictures are this year and the no mass pictures are, are, um, are this year. So note here that there's so much time for students to just work in small groups and I force them in small groups. They're not in the same group every time uh, it flexes. And then here, maybe one of the, the, the coolest things is I spend time and I, I guess I've just alluded to this, I'm doing a mastery check. So they have done uh, some information, all right? And then I walk around the room and I've got a clipboard. You don't see it there, it's blocked, but I've got a clipboard and I am checking off um, that they've completed to the level of mastery the work I'm asking them to do. And so I'm just asking them questions, asking them to defend their answer and I'm looking for the correct answer. And by the way, I'm doing something here that has saved me a lot of time. So tip, you know, pro tip number one, I stopped taking papers home to grade. So I'm not grading papers. What I'm doing is I'm asking them questions and looking at their work and saying, explain that why number three is number three and what you've said. And they may have the right answer, but sometimes, let's be honest, they've cheated and they copied it from their friends. Now I have to defend their answer to me. And if they can't, it's like, well, then go figure it out and we'll come talk later. I had a student who kept trying to explain today. The question was, why is it hot in the summer and cold in the winter? Um, and explain it, you know, using solar radiation. Uh, he, he just didn't have a clue. I said, well, I guess you aren't ready to get checked off when you're ready. And by the end of the class, he could explain it to me. <laughs> he went and found some help from some peers and he knew it by that time. Now, what about the big summative assessments? So number seven, summative assessments at the end. Uh, so here's the gist, right? If they fail the test, they have to take it again. And so here we have a young lady who's taking the assessment. She's doing it on the computer and when they're ready, and in my class, my expectation is that they have to score 80% on a summative assessment before they can move on. They have to. And let me say this. It sounds crazy, but all but one child this year has passed every summer. This COVID year have passed the summative assessment. And uh, I think that I'm going to get them all to pass by the end of this. And we're coming up on the very end of the school year. It's going to work. So seven, number seven was summit assessment. Number eight is thousands of versions. So this is sort of what the big hack I found years ago that has made this so much easier. So what I do, and I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see this. This is a, a picture from my learning management system. And you can see I've got uh, different questions and it's choosing random questions. Look at that mole, mole with reaction given, the very top thing there. I told the test to randomly pick one question of 14. So I wrote 14 questions. So when the student sits down to take the test, they are randomly given one of those 14 questions. And then they're, from the second batch, or if you will, file or folder, maybe is a better word, folder of questions, I wrote 13 questions. And they have to answer one of those questions. What this does, it ensures that when they sit down and take the test the second time, if they indeed they have to, that they're gonna get a different test. And in fact, every student who takes this test gets a different test. So there literally are thousands upon thousands of versions of the test. And it's not the same test with the questions um, scrambled. It's literally a different test. This takes a lot of work. So I wanna say this, I'm not gonna to lie to you. Setting up a mastery classroom is a lot of work. But you know, I'm doing this with probably 50 hours of work a week at my school. I'm setting it up in three different classes. I don't know, it, you know, I think I've learned to work smarter. Um, and once you're done, you're done. Like today, you know, it's the end of the school year. I had, it's like, I finished all my curriculum. I didn't have any papers to grade. So I took my laptop and I went out and it's a beautiful day here in Houston. And I went out and I sat in the courtyard and I <laughs> worked on my book, the book on mastery learning. So I got well, a section done. Uh, so when you're done, you're done. I mean, it's, it's cool. Um, immediate feedback, number nine, you actually have an opportunity. So what is happening right here with this young lady is she's finished her, her big summative test and she is going to come up and she says, Mr. Bergman, uh, can I go over your test? I said, absolutely. And we're going to go over their test and I'm going to evaluate their summative assessment with them standing right there. All right. So like in this next one, I've got an image of me with another young man. I think it's the same class and uh, the audio is not very good, but I'll just talk over this one. He is, he's brought me some paper and I'm going over his test, very question. Notice it's up on my screen. His test is on my screen, but I'm grading this and talking about his mistakes and doing remediation at that moment. And you say, how could I do that with 30 students? I do. The key though, is that I'm not spending any time standing up and lecturing. So my time is free to do these checks 
I'm walking around formatively, or in this case, summatively, checking each of my students. This just works. It works. We're getting crazy good results. It just works. Uh, number 10, as I've been writing my book, uh, I talked to a lot of teachers. I, I'm up to probably 20 different mastery, flip master returning teachers. And so many of them are gamifying this because if you think about it, they have to move through units. But if we change the units to levels and they're mastering, like you, you, you've played a video game or you know people who do. And when they play a video game, you level up, right? And, uh, you know, I guess one of the tenets of mastery learning if you haven't sort of picked this up by now, is that I don't care when my students learn something. I care that they learn something. I mean, that's an oversimplification. I do have schedules I have to keep. And so there is a when. They have to get it done by such and such a date. But, you know, for example, on the summative tests, I expect them to get an 80. If they take it four times, they have to get an 80. By the time they get an 80, then that's the score they get. But I have students who will come in this week, I'm sure, who said, I got an 82, Mr. Rory. Can I try to score a 92? And I'll say, absolutely. I, I, I don't penalize students for learning something late. I think, actually, I think that that's repulsive. <laughs> I, sorry, I, I, I think I'm not going to penalize somebody for learning late. They've learned it. Why well, penalize it, somebody? So anyways, I, I created gamification. This picture on the image is uh, each student is at the leaderboard and they're moving through the content. So I have a class B2. We have an A, B schedule. And so the B2 and these are each like a little symbol is a different student and they can watch their progress on the board. They love moving the little magnetized uh, thing across the board. It's just crazy easy to gamify it. They love being the one in the front. That's It's fun. And then, of course, I think maybe the top thing is it's relationship centered. Uh, I can't tell you how fulfilling my job is that I get to hang out with kids and get to know them and hear their struggles and listen to their thinking. And, uh, you know, cause one thing about flip learning, that's always been true. It's always been about relationships and about the connections, you know, a student doesn't know or doesn't, I would say this, a student doesn't care what you know until they know that you care. And, uh, because I have so many more interactions with my students, I think they, I, I know that they feel so much more seen and heard and cared for. Let's take a look at a video. Actually, let me back up. Let's take a look at a video of one of these summative tests or summative uh, questions that I think, uh, or sessions, pardon me, that would kind of be indicative. So this young lady has just come to me and uh, taken a boss battle. Uh, it, I call the test the boss battle. She's taken a boss battle. Uh, this is a year ago. She just has a mask on. And we're going over her boss battle so that she can do better the next time. Listen in. The bottom, I think. Um, but the, it's getting faster, right? So it's going, you know, let's round it to 10. After one second, it's going 10, and then 20, and then 30, and then 40. And I drop this. Every second, it's going 10 meters per second faster. 10, mm -hmm. 20, 30. So the difference is what they're getting. Okay. Can I come take it? So she had passed her boss battle, right? She got her more than her 80. And another thing I do, I switched actually, I, last year I had this song I would play whenever they passed it and then the whole class would hear. But now I, I purchased a gong on Amazon, you know, one of those, and when a student passes a boss battle, we, we gong them in and they love that. There's something about giving a celebration to your student that really makes a difference for them. And I think builds that relationship we just got done talking about. So that's the basic tenets of flip mastery learning, which I believe is the answer to the two sigma problem. Let's kind of return to where we started. COVID has been a tragedy. Uh, I'm sure many of you have faced terrible difficulties, maybe lost loved ones to COVID. I've certainly known people who have faced significant struggles. Many, my own son got COVID. He survived. He's a younger man. Uh, lots of issues that we've all faced these things. It's been a very, very difficult time. But I, I'm going to say something that may be somewhat controversial in that COVID is both a tragedy and it's also an opportunity, right? Opportunidad. We have an opportunity to rethink what education looks like. And I don't want us to waste that opportunity. Don't waste this opportunity. Because some of the barriers to flip learning and mastery learning have been technology. Guess what? Every teacher in the world has had to learn technology overnight. Otherwise, they're not teaching anymore. So some of the barriers, the early barriers to the things that I've been talking about for many, many years, even over a decade, 
went away with with COVID. And I want you to really rethink what this might look like. Because another cycle, right? The same old thinking often leads to the same old results. And we need to think differently about what education should and look like. You know, I've had a chance of great privilege of visiting many, many places all over the world. Uh, I don't know if I've, you know, I haven't told you this part of my, my story, but, you know, I, I, you know, helped write many, many books about flipped learning. I've gotten written 10 books. One, by the way, completely in Spanish, right? Uh, yeah, I would encourage you to pick it up. It's, it's relatively recent out of Spain. And so I was, I wrote the books and I had an opportunity to travel over the world. I've been all over South America I had been to Mexico and Colombia and Argentina and Brazil and all over uh, Central and South America and all over the world. I've been to Dubai. I've been to uh, London. I've been to China, Taiwan, Australia, Nueva Zealandia. I've been all over the world speaking about Flipper. And uh, in that time, I had a chance to really get to know lots of teachers who are using the model and I visited their schools and so as I talked about not just flipped, but flipped and mastery learning, I asked them to send me pictures. What does their classroom look like? Now, these are all pre-COVID pictures. But I want to encourage you to think about changing the way you teach, because maybe your classroom might look like this one in Iceland. This is the first fully flipped school in Iceland. And they teach the dropouts of Iceland. The school was designed to help students who dropped out of high school for many reasons, and they have become one of the highest achieving schools in Iceland. Here's one that looks like in Taiwan. This teacher is amazing. One of the early flipped learning pioneers and the work she's done is amazing. This is a teacher that I had a chance to meet in Morocco. And he actually is also the principal of the school and it's an English language school. And they have had so much active learning happening this guy is a total rock star. But notice what's happening. The kids are enjoying, they're active, they're in groups. This is uh, another friend in Singapore and out in his classroom. Again, this is all pre-COVID, but you get the idea. See the active things happening in these classrooms. Lots of group work. My friend Iran, yes, and Iran, a country that the U.S. is not on good relations with, but we... Uh, email back and forth and he sent me this video i don't have it in video form but this is a video he was showing about his active classroom and what is happening in his classroom i got a chance to visit this school harvard medical school all right this professor here has done some amazing work do you realize that harvard medical school is using this model i mean right yeah okay and this is the first fully flipped school in nueva zelandia and it's a primary school or an elementary school, and they are completely flipped and doing mastery life. I'm talking to three of their teachers for uh, research on my book next week, and the work that they're doing is phenomenal, phenomenal. This is another teacher in Hong Kong. And, I, and in Asian education, for your students to be doing active things like this, as opposed to sitting and getting from lecture, this is crazy. This is crazy. In Nigeria, it's happening. It's happening in Turkey, right? It's crazy. And the United Kingdom, España. This gal uses the, 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 the professor or the maestra. She uses uh, so much project-based learning in her approach with her flipped and her mastery approach. A friend here in Australia, this is what he's doing. So much time to really interact with students. In China, right? I had a chance to visit uh, China and the stuff they're doing there is also phenomenal. In Argentina. Now, those of you from Argentina, folks, if you have not talked to the folks in Misiones, right? All right, Misiones, Argentina, they have decided to flip their entire state, the state of Misiones. They have maybe 200,000 students. They're in the process of doing this, and it's, it's working rapidly. So if you are close and have an opportunity, uh, send me an email, and I will connect you with the Secretary of Education for uh, Misiones, uh, who's a friend, and maybe you could go visit what's happening there. It is one of the most amazing stories, I think, in education in the world happening right now, and probably not very far from, from you, right? So right on the border, Misiones is the border between Brazil and Argentina. They're close to Iguazu, Iguazu Falls, one of the most amazing things happening in the world right now. This is close to where I used to live in Chicago, so Gurney, Illinois, uh, a mastery teacher, and she's doing mastery with her math. I just interviewed her for this book 
an amazing, amazing teacher. And here's my class. We saw this image a little bit earlier. It's working, folks. It's working. We have solved. We have solved. It's crazy. The double sigma problem. Now we need people to use the model. So I'm challenging you. All right? Say el cambio. You can be the change. Yes, you. If you make the change to flip master, your world will change. In fact, let me promise, if you really embrace this model and use it well, when I say you, I'm talking to the global you. If that you is you, an individual teacher, I'm talking to you. If it's you, a department, ustedes, of, of teachers, if it's a school, the school that chooses this and does this well will be the school that will rocket to the top of the scores or whatever you want to measure, the metrics in your region, whether that is in... Your, your city, maybe you're in Sao Paulo, and this, you want to be the top school in Sao Paulo? Or maybe you're in Mexico City, right? Or you're in Medellin. Do you want to be the top school there? Embrace this model. Or maybe it's, it's like your state. Maybe you're in one of the states of, or provinces. Maybe you're in Misiones. Actually, you've got something to fight. If you're in Argentina, you're going to have to beat Misiones. And uh, they're heady. <laughs> so you got a lot of catching up to do. And so I want to promise that if you would embrace this model full well and full hearty, you, you change the world. Because when we change the life of a child, we change the world. Si. Se el cambio. Se ya a munduncha. I, I don't know how to say it in Portuguese. You can be the change. Thank you very much.